So for 20 years I was a pharmacist, then I got into research, supervised by grants. We had some robust debates along the way. Um, but one of the things that's happened since is I've become now a full-time academic. But when you become a full-time academic, you end up having to make a choice. If you want to get, take on research full-time, you have to chase your funding grants to give you a salary. I haven't been able to do that yet. So I have to go the other route and teach. It's great. It means I've got a full-time job at the university, but it does mean that about half of my time is taken up by teaching undergraduates. But because of my pharmacy background, I get to teach the undergraduates in health sciences basic pharmacy practice. And along the way, my, my team, because there's five of us on the team, they gave me the diabetes lectures and the endocrinology lectures. So I'm actually very pleased to say that over the last two years, about 1,400 students of nursing, paramedicine, midwifery, physiotherapy, podiatry. We don't teach medicine, dentistry, or optometry, but we do teach the oral health students. Um, but they've all been exposed to Ludwig's metabolic theory of obesity. They get exposed to <coughs> complications of hyperinsulinemia. And they get exposed to the fact that type 2 diabetes is late stage hyperinsulinemia. I take it as a win when somebody will spontaneously ask me after I've taught them about the sulfonyl ureas, what's the rationale for using sulfonyl ureas in people with type 2 di diabetes when these medicines increase your insulin level? I take that as a win. Sorry. My students have to do that to me as well because our lectures are videoed and I keep wandering off and somebody keeps showing me back in. <coughs> but when I teach them about, this is one of the slides that I give them, I teach them about insulin and glucagon as a review and we say that what anything insulin does, glucagon does the opposite. But when I'm teaching them about insulin, this is the slide that I give them and they have to learn at least five of these things for, you know, I say, if we're going to be examining you on the actions of insulin, you can't just tell me that it increases glucose uptake in muscle and adipose tissue, because the primary job of insulin is to stop gluconeogenesis. But I also hammer home the fact that you won't get a breakdown of fat if your insulin levels are high. You cannot lose weight very easily if your insulin levels are high. So, and I hammer that home. But the other thing that we do with undergraduates is we don't just want to get facts into them. We also want them to learn how to think. So I think it probably drives them nuts at times. But the most common phrase that they hear from me, apart from trying to encourage the fact that you can't lose weight if your insulin levels are high, is, so what does that mean? This means what? So what does that mean? So I've learned a lot about insulin over the last few years and a lot about the low carbohydrate management of hyperinsulinemia. And if I'm asking my students to ask, so what does that mean? I have to ask myself the same question. So if the primary role of insulin is to balance glucagon, what happens to your glucagon levels when insulin is suppressed? So let's talk a little bit more about some glucagon. So as I said, you know, before, with my undergraduates, I teach them that the role of glucagon is to balance insulin and vice versa. But as I started learning more and more about glucagon, there's more to it than that. Insulin could be described as an energy storage hormone. It tries to get everything, you know, glucose into glycogen and then into fat. It tries to store everything. So glycogen helps to break things down. But there's more to it than that. Glycogen affects food intake levels and increases energy expenditure. Well, whereas when we teach that we need glycogen when there is hypoglycemia, so why does glucagon increase energy expenditure? And also, it has cardiovascular effects. Glucagon increases the strength of heart contractility and uh, regulates heart rate. So there's more to glucagon than just simply balancing insulin. 
there's more. 1975, Roger Unger said that hyperglucagonemia is responsible for all hyperglycemia. And it's gone on with another series of um, experiments so I can show you. Ben Bickman, by the way, did an excellent presentation with this at Breckenridge when he talked about the insulin glucagon ratio and why it can make a big difference to your glucose levels on your protein. And so when some people eat a lot of protein, their glucose levels spike quite dramatically. People with type 1 diabetes often need a lot more um, insulin, but in other people says it doesn't. And it comes down to the ratio between insulin and glucagon. And these people on a standard American diet, you know, fasting, baseline, 0.8, low carb, high fat, about 1.3, standard American diet, about four. After a protein load of one gram per kilo, we now have glucagon being spiked quite dramatically. And that can make a big difference for the glucose. So we look at the physiology of the glucagon and we'll see why and how it doesn't matter if you've got type one or type two diabetes, high levels of glucagon will still spike your glucose levels. Insulin, and somatostatin from the beta cell, oh, well, somatostatin comes from the delta cells, but in your islets in the pancreas, you've got all of those cells that we've already seen a couple of times this morning. Insulin is believed to directly suppress glucagon levels at, that, in the, at the pancreatic level. So when insulin is secreted, it will suppress glucagon. Somatostatin is another hormone that suppresses both glucagon and insulin. So with people with type 1 diabetes, there's no insulin. So there's nothing to suppress the glucagon at the pancreatic level. And we see this, this study done in 1976. Um, patients with type 1 diabetes, they came into hospital. They had 14 hours of an insulin infusion. And when the insulin was withdrawn, you can see the glucagon goes up, free fatty acids go up, beta-hydroxybutyrate goes up, the glucose goes up. These people were heading towards diabetic ketoacidosis. However, those same people got either somatostatin and then saline or vice versa. They wanted to see what happens when you infuse somatostatin. Somatostatin suppresses glucagon release from the pancreas. It also suppresses insulin, but these people don't have functioning beta cells, so... It's and the white one is somatostatin, so, and the black line is saline. And you see that the black line pretty well mimics what happens in the natural situation when the insulin is withdrawn. But the white one is where they were given the glucagon. The glucagon is completely suppressed, but we do not get a dramatic rise in glucose levels. We also don't get a dramatic rise in beta-hydroxybutyrate levels either. So that's what really just sort of drives home that glucagon is highly involved with uh, glucogenesis, but also ketogenesis. Very difficult to get into ketosis if your glucagon levels are too low. Well, what happens in people with type 2 diabetes? Slightly different story. Here it's believed that insulin resistance at the pancreatic level, possibly due to fat deposition within the pancreas, directly um, causes insulin resistance at the alpha cells. So although the insulin is being secreted, it's not reaching the alpha cells. And this may be one of the reasons why Roy Taylor from the 2015 study said, one gram of fat loss from your pancreas can make a dramatic difference to your insulin resistance status and your health status. And we can see this when, again, we've got people with um, non-diabetic insulin profiles, insulin and glucose, when the glucagon is suppressed and when the glucagon is not suppressed. We do get a glucose load, nothing really changes with their insulin. But you can see that there is a slight difference to their glucose levels. And people with type 2 diabetes, quite a big difference to their glucose levels without there being a change to insulin. So glucagon really is a major player when it comes to the pathogenesis of diabetes. These people have done a very similar study 
And they've shown that in people with normal glucose tolerance, the light blue, impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance, the dark blue, or type 2 diabetes, the red, glucagon following an oral glucose load might be suppressed, but the time differences can be very different. And there might be an increase in glucagon initially. And that increase in glucagon combined with the glucose load is liable to lead to a quite a high blood glucose level. And this is the amount of suppression. So again, we do not get the suppression of glucagon following an oral glucose load that you would normally expect from somebody who's got normal glucose uh, tolerance compared to somebody with type 2 diabetes. And a very similar pattern happened in people when they divided them up into insulin-sensitive status as well. People who, had the, who were the least insulin-sensitive, the most insulin-resistant, had the, um, it took a lot longer for the suppression of glucagon to happen. And I suspect that might also be happen when you look at the most likely pattern of insulin response from these people. From the work that I did with the Kraft data set, a Kraft 1 pattern considered to be a normal insulin response was a small amount of insulin at baseline, peaking at about 30 to 60 minutes, which kind of lines up with this suppression state here, dropping back down at 120 minutes. But a Kraft pattern 3, which is one of the most common patterns to occur with people with impaired glucose tolerance or type 2 diabetes, as it indicates increasing insulin resistance, you don't get your peak until 120 minutes. So it's not just the amount of insulin resistance, it's the amount of insulin that's also being released from the pancreas that is theoretically playing a problem here. But when you look at all the things that affect the glucagon secretion, glucagon's inhibited by insulin, somatostatin. And here's our friend GLP-1 that um, Sheila was talking about before lunch. Leptin, GABA, GABA um, gamma amino hydroxybutyrate, I think, is, um, is a calming hormone. A benzodiazepine such as uh, midazolam or diazepam, it increases the amount of GABA that you've got. So essentially, it's your anti-stress hormone. All of these things can inhibit glucagon. Whereas on the other side, low glucose levels, adrenaline, cortisol, stress, cold, GIP, which is one of those other hormones that Sheila was mentioning this morning, all of these things can increase your glucagon secretion. So when we're trying to sort of balance what's happening with somebody with our diabetes, it's not just enough to think about insulin. We have to start thinking about glucagon and all of these things that affect glucagon secretion. And we start looking at the gut hormones. GIP is produced quite high. That glucose load is going to cause you know, the, the um, orange juice from the part of the healthy breakfast that a lot of hospitals like to give you that's going to cause a release of GIP. That GIP is going to increase your glucagon and increase your insulin. But if you're not able to quite handle that glucose load, you've got, it's very difficult to suppress that. A lot more of the refined carbohydrates that are eaten do not get down into the lower gut where GLP is being secreted, which helps to suppress the glucagon. <coughs> Leptin and ghrelin also get featured here as well. Leptin is produced by adipose tissue and is stimulated by insulin levels. But the ghrelin can change insulin levels depending on um, your somatostatin status. How much somatostatin is there seems to affect the ghrelin. But then all of these things seem to affect the next level up. So when you start looking at one hormone, it starts to become extremely complicated because each hormone seems to affect the other, and it's probably going to take um, probably an engineering genius to draw the flowchart diagram on this one to go, what affects what? So how do we manage a lot of these things? So it all comes back to, you know, so, so what does this mean? Well, for me personally, it becomes quite a challenge. Um, this is the machine I have got at AUT on which I can measure insulin. I take my blood sample, centrifuge it, pop it into the machine. 15 to 20 minutes later, it spits out a result on a dot matrix printer. We're running out of paper. Um, 
but you know, that's, that's the machine that we've got, but it's still the same quality. But when I want to measure glucagon or any of these other hormones, I have to come back to being the chemist that I often am accused of being. It takes two days, put your sample in each well, put two drops from bottle one into it, then leave it for four hours on a shake table, wash it out, leave it over, add some more to it, leave it overnight, incubate it. It takes about two days. It's very expensive, it's about $30 a sample. So that's my challenge. But what does it mean, though, for glycemic management? Well, for starters, it means that we need to start considering both insulin and glucagon when we're looking at glycemic management. And I don't just mean this for glucagon. Uh, for those that don't recognize it, it's a hypo kit that a lot of people with type 1 carry around in case of diabetic emergencies. But here's where the pharmacist in me has come out. It's a case, OK, so we've got these medicines that we use to treat diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. What do they do to glucagon? So very basic, it's a basic mechanism of action. Um, what does it do to fasting glucagon, presprandial glucagon? Have there been any other studies looking at this? And how many studies have we got? So when you look at metformin, two large studies, two small studies, it basically works by uh, decreasing gluconeogenesis and increasing um, GLUT4 trans translocation to the top of the cell um, walls and the muscles. So I describe it to patients as it makes the insulin you've got work better, but it doesn't increase the amount of insulin that you have. What does it do to fasting glucagon? It doesn't really change anything, but some of the other studies were sort of showing mixed results in response to different stimulatory effects. The sulfonylureas, they work by increasing insulin secretion from the beta cells. Theoretically, you'd like to think that they um, would then suppress fasting insulin because it's working at the beta cells, but very much mixed reports. Some studies say there's an improvement in um, glucagon and it lowers the levels in glucagon. Other levels have shown that it made no change or even increased the glucagon levels. And the large number of studies that have been done reflect the fact that so many different sulfonylureas have been studied. But none of them seem to perform any better than the others, which is why I grouped them together. So they don't really seem to um, help as far as glucagon is concerned. And exogenous insulin, quite distinct from endogenous insulin, the insulin you make yourself, the exogenous insulin is the insulin that you inject. Four small studies, no real knowledge, decreased or neutral results. But when you think about where the exogenous insulin is being injected, it's coming into the subcutaneous tissue for systemic distribution, it's not really going to be getting to the beta cells and the alpha cells in the pancreas. Then we move on to the second generations. Now, these medicines are not funded in New Zealand, so I have very, very little clinical practice with them. I even had to stop and look up what are some of the, the names of the medications because I look at them just as a big class effect. But when you agonise, that's what the A means there, the GLP-1, with medicines such as um, exanatide, these medicines increase insulin, but they also decrease glucagon levels, but they only work during hyperglycemia. They don't seem to make any difference to your insulin and glucagon levels during periods of normal glycemia or hypoglycemia. They don't change your fasting levels of glucagon, but there was a significant decrease to postprandial glucagon. There's a reasonable number of studies that have been done. The DPP-4 inhibitors prevent the breakdown of GLP-1. And some studies said there was either no change, some studies said there was a decreased amount of fasting glucagon, but with the postprandial, it was also decreased. And again, a reasonable number of studies. Then you've got the SGL-2 inhibitors. These are the ones that cause the kidneys to excrete glucose. Quite frankly, why can't we just get these people to eat less glucose? But when you look at what happens to the glucagon levels, there is a significant increase to the glucagon levels. So, right, that's fine. So that is what has what happened during an oral glucose tolerance test, isolated information. What actually happens in practice? 
especially, you know, there's a lot of information to say that for people with type 2 diabetes, there's some improvements in their HbA1c levels with these medicines, but what happens in people with type 1? So there was a study that was done of the addition of xanatide, which is a GLP-1 agonist, or the citagliptin, which is the um, DPP-4 um, inhibitor. I always get that. I have to stop, always have to stop and think about those ones. When it was added to insulin in new onset type 1 diabetes. So what they found is that with the addition of both of those medicines, daily insulin started off at about um, one unit per kilo. And there was a, you know, it was relatively small numbers, six people in each group. Insulin alone, after the uh, follow-up, they had decreased their insulin amount by um, 0.3 units per kilo. So they were down to 0.7 um, units per kilo. So that's just the study effect. But when you look at what happened with the addition of the um, exanatide, they um, decreased their insulin load to about 0.3 units per kilo over the course of the day. Now, that's actually quite a dramatic drop in the amount of insulin that these people are using over the course of the day. And with the citagliptin, the DPP-4 inhibitor, they also halved their amount of insulin usage over the day. But their challenge is when this was happening is, remember what I said, glucagon has cardiovascular effects. What they have found and they are concerned about with some of these people is, is there an increased risk of heart failure? So it's one of those that needs to be done cautiously, but at the same time, maybe this is a, another piece that we can add into the arsenal of uh, diabetes management. Um, and it just really goes to highlight to me is that we've got so many other hormones. You know, for three and a half thousand years, we were concerned about glucose. We've started looking at insulin. But actually, we need to go back and quite frankly reinvent the wheel from what Unger and people were doing in 1975 and go back to look at glucagon. But now we've got the new incretins coming through, GLP-1 and um, GIP. We can't ignore those ones as well. It's going to be one hell of a challenge to look at all of these things because they all influence each other, but they cannot be ignored. So diabetes, according to Unger's group, needs to be considered at least as a bi-hormonal disease. There is an argument coming through that it needs to be at least a tri-hormonal disease with GIP being considered. That's the one that's in the upper end of the gut. But treatments should also look at what's happening to the glucagon levels as well as the insulin levels. And other gut hormones should be considered. So quite frankly, at the moment, I think we cannot be ignoring glucagon. There's a whole lot of references that are there for you for later on. So thank you very much. <laughs>